In March 2016, in the middle of the election, you know, buzz um, and turmoil, or as it was gaining steam, Bloomberg News published a fantastic uh, graphic, you know, why voters will stay angry. Okay, and we looked at, you know, certain metrics, including the global middle class uh, getting poorer, youth being worse off, and immigration making people really anxious. So those were just three of the metrics we looked at. And so it's been almost exactly three years to the day and nothing's changed. Okay, so just to take a look at, you know, global youth unemployment, for, for instance, is still excessive. Um, if you look at student debt, it's off the charts. And a majority of people are still worried about immigration. So we'll get that, uh, that last graphic up. There we go, to student debt and immigration. So, so I guess my question really to, to the three of you, that, that when you think about the work that you do, uh, what, what's changed from that moment in March 2016 and to now? Take us a little bit and quickly beyond the numbers. Cindy? Thank you for having me first and foremost, Jackie. I will tell you that as the CEO of an organization whose goal is to protect and defend the Latino community, we've certainly seen a lot. We've seen an increase in hate crimes, We've seen an increase in terms of attacks that are anti-Hispanic, anti-Latino. Uh, we've seen an increase of fear in our communities. And I just want you to think of the rhetoric that we hear daily, every single day, and how that it's impacting subconsciously all of our communities across the country. I would say that what's most interesting to me is that what hasn't changed is the environment. It, it, discrimination, and particularly around immigrants and immigration, is driven by fear. If you're vilifying a group of people, then you can sustain that fear. And I think it's been sustained for political purposes mm -hmm. rather than in really trying to create a society and an environment that realizes we've always been a nation of immigrants. Nobody took their jobs. The jobs may have gone away, but that whole conversation I just heard the tail end of, how are we going to get people into jobs of the future? Mm -hmm. And they're using it as an excuse to really preserve their own agenda. So which change has kind of gotten worse. No. Gotten <laughs> Ali, worse. Um, you know, as head of the National Immigration Forum, which advocates for immigration to this country, when you think about things that are going on around us globally, like the UK teeter-tottering on the edge of an exit from the European Union, um, you had that hor horrific um, uh, massacre in New Zealand of a mosque, and you've got yellow vest protesters in France, you know, on a weekly basis. Wh which nation, if any, um, can one look to uh, for inspiration, you know, when it comes to striking that balance around political rhetoric and an equitable immigration policy? Well, I, I think that, um, I mean, look, this issue of migration, global migration, is going to remain above the fold for decades to come. Right now, you've got 65 million people forcibly displaced from their homes. You have 250 million people who are living outside of their home country. Um, and all of this leads to this fear and anxiety that plays out in all these places, in all these countries and communities. So the easy answer is a place like Canada. I think uh, Canada has really worked hard to welcome immigrants, integrate immigrants, and now they're working really hard to steal the immigrants from the US uh, and welcome them to Canada to start their businesses. But I would also make the case for a place like Idaho. Red estate in the country, Idaho Dairymen Association are, were the first ones in Idaho to protect the refugee community in the state. Um, they're out there making the case locally at the state level nationally of why immigrants and refugees help everybody in Idaho prosper. So I think there are examples at a global level, but there are also examples uh, here in the U.S. And locally, great. I mean, Canada, um, it's great you mentioned that because it's interesting in the sense that it's having its biggest influx of immigrants in more than a century. Okay, and it's, it's also taking visa, you know, U.S. visa rejects, right. um, putting them in their best schools, um, and giving them a chance to start businesses that contribute to, to that economy. And, and I wonder, Jan, um, you know, with that in mind, what kind of discussions are happening within the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, of which you're a member, around this question of staying relevant and staying competitive when we close our borders? And, and I would note I'm their token member. Um, I'm their token Democrat. Was her token woman for a long time. Okay, so this <laughs> progress. But what's really interesting about the conversation that's taking place at the U.S. Chamber 
<clears throat> is it's divided the membership. Generally, the chamber agrees on everything, but on the question of immigration, they do not. And I think they're almost overwhelmingly pro-immigration because they understand this is the future of their businesses. This is their workforce. And what's happening in the country is putting that in jeopardy. And so you're seeing a very different voice emerge from the United States Chamber of Commerce. I would also mention when you look, I mean, Nevada, right. one in five of our citizens are immigrants. 25% of our workforce are minority immigrants. So, you know, I think we're a very good story as well. So business is unified on this idea that... Oh, absolutely. Interesting. Um, you know, Cindy, in our pre-talk, you know, we, 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 you mentioned, you know, this is a country built on immigration, um, immigrant labor, and immigrants have built and, and expanded industries like, you know, tech, um, innovation. And I wondered, you know, from your, your vantage, how do we get back to this sentiment of pride and, and openness? I think it comes down to changing the narrative and understanding our history, a history that oftentimes is not told in the history books or taught to our own children. And the fact is that immigrants are 5.6% of the workforce. We're 15% of the income earners. That in California, we pay more than 25% of local and state taxes. That in places like New York and New Jersey, we pay close to the same amount, 25% in local and state taxes. And that our contributions are great, but also the American story. And, and I wanted to pause and share that you know, I was brought to this country at the age of one, undocumented from Honduras, from San Pedro Sula, which, is, which has the highest murder rate per capita in the world. And walking in South Central, when every day my mom would drop me off at school because they were undocumented, she would tell me, hija, you know, please remember to call your aunt Rosita if we don't come to pick you up. And I just want the audience to think about the fear and the trauma that this places in our children and our future Americans. And, and you know, I tell that story because only in this country can you have an, an immigrant like myself who picked up cans in the streets of Los Angeles and clean houses become the CEO of the largest and oldest national Latino civil organization in the country. This is the American dream. And I think also, especially when we look at our corporations and our different workforce sectors, it's looking at our agricultural sector, where we're more than 46% that, you know, should something, should they all be deported and you go to the grocery stores, you will find <laughs> empty shelves right. because the workforce is not there to backfill. And that we're also a major component of construction in building this country. And there's individuals like Albert Einstein who are immigrants and so many others that have contributed to innovation and technology in making this country what it is today. Thank you. I just wanted to um, break a little bit and ask the audience if they would take their phones out. I just want to do one quick poll. And this is actually guiding my conversation, so I appreciate if you take part. Um, I'm going to ask, just pick one of three factors that you think will most polarize electorates in coming years when you're thinking about immigration policy. So social media, AI, slash automation, climate change. Ah, social media. OK. All right. So, so I want to get to the social media point, but I also want to talk about artificial intelligence and automation technology because we, were, we had a CEO of a global tech firm in our offices recently, and we asked him sort of the usual, you know, what keeps you up at night? And, you know, I thought he was going to say, you know, my share price or my P&L. He said, um, you know, AI keeps me up at night because it risks making an already imbalanced world that less equal and intellectual horsepower and the data benefit a spectrum of the population. So I'm just going to ask of any of you, really, does the immigration debate become that much more difficult at a time when people worry that a computer can do their job or they don't have the skills to navigate a digitized economy? I think, Jackie, if we think about this, at the very core of the question, it's economic security. And the fact is that wages have remained stagnant, that the earnings for the middle class 
have remained stagnant. And so in thinking of the framing of the question, it's really thinking about economic security and those push pull factors that are involved, including technology and the involvement, involvement of technology and displacement in the displacing workers. I think there's a, uh, an opportunity here for corporate America to not just understand how artificial intelligence is changing the economy and changing how Americans perceive work, but also how corporate America is helping Americans understand how the country is changing. Uh, so uh, about a year ago, we, came, we started uh, something called the Corporate Roundtable for the New American Workforce. It's co-chaired by Chobani and, and Walmart, uh, uh, um, Driscoll's Berries is part of it, or a number of, you know, talking to many others. But they are working together to say, okay, how do we explain to the American public at a national level, but more importantly at a local level, what this looks like? Um, and then, you know, with driverless cars, right? Uh, Lyft in the news a lot for their upcoming IPO. Yesterday, they released news that an English language learning program that we're working with them on to train their drivers to improve their English language skills is part of their social investment. So they're saying, as a company, we're going to invest in our workers. We're going to invest. Uh, not just training the foreign-born workforce, but others, so that our customers have a better experience. And it's those kinds of steps that I think corporate America can take to help the public understand how not just the nation is changing, but how the narrative needs to change. I think you still have to look at both public education, both at uh, beginning at an elementary level, to secondary, to college. If you're still telling students you're going to go to college, you're going to get a degree, and you're going to get a job. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to end up angry yep. and frustrated because there's no opportunity. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to change the way you're training your students, the skills you're giving them, and having that done in alignment with corporate America and where we see jobs going. And more quickly on that, can, what can you say about your role <clears throat> working um, as an executive at Caesars Entertainment, how you approach that? Well, you know, at Caesars Entertainment, we look at immigration and immigration policy and how we can support our workforce, particularly those that are looking um, to become citizens. But I do it more. I chair the Public Education Foundation. And I think that public education in this country today is inherently flawed in how we're both teaching and testing and training our Good students. Point. So, so <clears throat> just to, since the audience um, ticked climate is the least thing that's polarizing or, or going to uh, galvanize electorates, I wanted to, to bring this into the discussion because, you know, the one thing our government team did when they looked at that angry voters chart from 2016, they said there's one new thing we would add to the mix, and that's climate. Not only because of its, you know, it's galvanizing young people and people generally in a new way, but it also has a, has a point, it's related to immigration. So climate refugees are not a new thing, but extreme weather does exasperate migration trends in, an al in already impoverished nations. Where does climate, does climate fit into this discussion where you're I think it fits in into your point that severe climate is driving immigration both in our country and other countries. But I still go back to social media. When you're listening to what you want to hear and what you're hearing is making you angry and afraid, that's going to galvanize how you see the world. So I would, uh, you know, a lot of the conversation these days is about Central America and Central American migrants seeking asylum in the United States. Uh, when you look at the data in a place like Honduras, you know, the majority of that economy is driven by agriculture. The majority of your agricultural crops are climate dependent, bananas, coffee. So when there's a hurricane, when there's a drought, there are a lot of people who are put out of work. They go to the cities, there's no opportunity for the cities in the cities, and they have a choice. They can pay a smuggler $10,000, or they can join together in safety and go to another country to seek, seek protection. You know, climate change is going to continue to, to be a huge push factor, you know, frankly, practically next door to the US. Right. I would add, Jackie, that I completely agree in the sense that what we're looking at our borders is a symptom of a problem, and that we have to address the root causes of that push factor, whether it's the environment and climate change, or whether it's the, the democracies and the governance of the countries, and having the jobs in place to be able to keep the population in place, as well as the safetyness. Right. Um, I wanted to put myself in this question, actually. You know, there's this adage, the last one in, shut the door. So, so I live in the UK, and, and during the Brexit vote, there were pockets within the immigrant communities 
who supported uh, the UK leaving the EU because they said they didn't want more Eastern Europeans coming in, um, which is like, you yeah, know, interesting. Um, <laughs> so, you know, whether it's first generation or sixth generation immigration that we're talking about, is, is there a parallel discussion to be had about the community within the community and how we treat each other on the scale of spectrum of sort of immigration and, and what works and what doesn't work? Well, I think of course there is. I mean, I was in discussion with the chairman of the Latin Chamber of Commerce in Las Vegas, and the majority of his membership, they sort of support building a wall. Hmm. They're fearful. They're concerned that more people are coming in, and again, that they won't have the job opportunities. So you would think they would be a natural ally mm -hmm. in opposition, and in fact, they're not. So and I, a lot of this, to me, comes down to the politics of it, though. I mean, you look at Brexit. Brexit happened because the elected officials failed to do what they were elected to do, and that was make a reasoned decision. So they left it to the voter who's voting on a motion. That's right. just absurd. And, and the more we do that, mm -hmm. the further we're going to exacerbate these problems. I would say that we're also looking at the propaganda that's coming out in the current political time. And that if there's ever been a time when you see that words do matter, words matter. When you have someone that's a candidate calling an entire nation rapist, that matters. When you have you know, people at the highest level creating fear in people who may be of another nationality or non-citizens creating that lack of tolerance, there's a problem. And so, you know, when we look at all those dynamics, it's important to make sure that we're very conscious of what we're consuming as consumers, whether it's through the media or what we're hearing through um, our own networks and make sure that we check our own biases and that we're not buying into this. And, you know, when we look at the different generations, we, fe we forget that there's so many intersections that within the Hispanic community, you have all of the races, that you have the intersectionality of Afro-Latinos and others. And it's making sure that we understand those dichotomies. And I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, last year, we did uh, 26 living room conversations in conservative, suburban, and rural communities. And we did this in a partnership with an organization out of the UK, More Uncommon. And we found that the American public has three questions when it comes to immigration, which I think pertains to you know, whether you're an American who's been here for generations or an American who got here you know, 10 years ago. Those three questions cut across culture, security, and economy. Mm -hmm. Culturally, are immigrants and refugees integrating or isolating? Security, are they threats or protectors? And from an economic perspective, are immigrants and refugees giving or taking? As journalists, as leaders, as advocates, if we ignore those questions, we're, not gonna, we're just talking to ourselves. So for us, we're always trying to make the case that immigrants and refugees are protecting Americans and American values, giving back to our economy and our communities, and ultimately becoming American themselves. But we have to keep in mind those fears. Otherwise, voters will stay angry. Except that this whole conversation sometimes just all of us are immigrants, unless you're American Indian. Right. Or maybe the three of us left that came on the May Mayflower. I mean, come on. Right. 50 percent of Fortune 500 right. companies were started by immigrants. Second generation, Jeff Bezos and um, Apple. What are we talking about? You know, now we're trying to make some kind of rationalization and excuse for what we all are. Yeah. It, it doesn't make sense, which means something else is driving it. So unfortunately, the, the clock is winding down, but I got to ask you really quickly, um, fragmented um, you know, political candidates out there, who is the best place to see through this balance of rhetoric and equitable action? Well, I was the mayor of Las Vegas for eight years, so I know a little bit about rough and tumble politics. But <laughs> <laughs> this election is going to be for the hearts and minds of the independents. That's who's going to make the difference. And it, this is only my opinion. I think the only voice that can move those independents into a Democratic column is Joe Biden. OK. Joe Biden, any, anyone else? I would just agree that just like the midterms of last year was about the, the independent moderate voter, the 2020 is going to be all about the candidate who can capture that middle. And there are gazillions of voters out there who are looking for that message. 
And I would agree, and I, and I would say something to also keep in mind, it's some of the things that are playing in the background, like the census, and include the inclusion of the citizenship question in the census and the impact of what that means for everyone across this country. That's great points. Thank you, Cindy, Jan, and Ali. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.